My name is uh, Liz Jalian. I'm based at Loughborough University, and I'm going to talk a little bit about AI and archives from a researcher's point of view. So let me say a few words about uh, my background. I mean, I'm a literary scholar by training. Um, not a lot of literary scholars work on AI, as you can imagine. Uh, I was trained in a very traditional way. You know, I spent many years working on traditional paper documents. Uh, and I've started becoming interested in born digital archives approximately seven years ago, uh, when I suddenly realized that, you know, people do not, uh, writers, of course, do not write letters anymore. They write emails. Uh, they do not write uh, paper reports anymore. You know, they write documents or PDFs. Uh, so, of course, all of us, we produce a lot of born digital records, and this has an impact on researchers. So, um, so I started working in the email archive of the writer Ian McEwen. Uh, so for those of you who know a little bit about Ian McEwen, uh, his archive is actually based uh, in Texas uh, at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas. So I was very lucky to, to get access to this email archive, which is usually uh, closed uh, to researchers. And I've been doing some more work on email archives. You know, I worked in the Susan Sontag archive at UCLA last summer. Um, so I kind of, you know, specialized in those kind of email archives. And of course, anybody who has done some work on born digital archives realizes that uh, it's very tricky to get access to these born digital archives for many reasons, for copyright, for uh, data protection reasons, uh, technical issues, etc., etc. So access is a big issue, basically. So I started uh, becoming involved in several networks as UKPI. Uh, so I've worked uh, on the Aura project, uh, which was uh, funded by the HRC in the UK and by the Irish Research Council in Ireland. And for this project, I worked with uh, Annalina Caputo, uh, who is the Irish PI, and she uh, she's a computer scientist, actually. So as I said, I'm a literary scholar. You know, I worked with this computer scientist. And the project was very much about bringing together digital humanist, computer scientists, and various stakeholders. So, of course, archivists, you know, people who work in, uh, in the cultural heritage sector. So that was very interesting for me, you know, to start uh, working with computer scientists, very challenging as well, because, of course, the language that we use is not always the same. Uh, and we actually co-authored an article with Annalina Caputo. So actually, you know, working, publishing something with a computer scientist can be also very challenging, but very exciting uh, as well. So at the moment, I'm still involved in uh, three different projects. There's the Eolian project, which is funded by the HRC and the National Endowment for the Humanities in the US. Uh, so it's a UK-US project uh, on AI for cultural organizations. And we are working with many, many partners for this project as well. It's very international and with a multitude of partners uh, as well. Uh, the ICON project is a bit different. We're working on early conflict photography, so colonial photographies, uh, and very sensitive uh, photos, like, you know, photos of war, photos of violence. And we want to apply AI to those kind of archives to make them uh, more accessible, because many of these photos that are actually hidden are inaccessible at the moment. So, and this project is funded again by the HRC. So you've seen that the HRC has been very generous with, uh, with me and also uh, by Labex in France. So it's a, a UK French project. And of course, the Luster project, we're here as part of the Luster project today, uh, which is on unlocking our digital past with AI, uh, of course, with many partners, with the Cabinet Office, with the National Archives, and many other partners. So this gives you an overview of the kind of you know, experience that I have, the kind of work I've been doing. And I think if you, if you try to find a coherence to this project, it's very much you know, trying to bring together many stakeholders, people who sometimes do not communicate with each other. I mean, as a literary scholar, generally I wouldn't have a chat with a computer scientist. And sometimes it can be difficult to, to bring people together you know, around uh, the same table and have a common uh, conversation. So let's 
have a look at the key problem here just to sum up. I mean, policymakers and all record creators produce digital records on a daily basis. We talked about that already. You know, we produce emails, we produce uh, PDFs, Word documents, AV5s, etc. A selection of those records is then preserved in our archival repositories, but getting access is, of course, extremely complicated uh, because of those reasons we mentioned data protection, copyright, sensitivity, uh, national security for some records, etc. etc. So there are many, many issues, of course, here. So is artificial intelligence the solution? I mean, is it like, you know, the perfect uh, solution to those problems that we've mentioned? Uh, of course, it can be applied to archives to make them more accessible. And I'm sure you know about sensitivity review, you know, trying to identify sensitive documents and perhaps try to uh, trying to make uh, non-sensitive documents more accessible. Uh, AI can be used also to, uh, to automatically create metadata when metadata is missing. And of course, AI can be used also to search vast amounts uh, of uh, documents. So AI can be useful, but it is still very much at an experimental stage. There are many, many issues, issues with skills gap, for example. Uh, of course, people who have these kind of skills, you know, are generally very highly impaired, uh, which can be uh, difficult, uh, you know, in the public sector, in the university sector, you know, to match these kind of salaries. But I would say this is quite a minor issue. And the main issue is probably the issue of mistrust, miscommunication, people not talking to each other. And it's actually what we discovered when we started doing interviews as part of the projects I've been leading. You know, we've uh, interviewed many archivists, many, uh, many academics as well, people in government, etc., etc. And we've realized that the issue of trust is very much a problem here. So really, this talk is about trust, trust in other people and trust in the technology uh, as well. Uh, something we sometimes do not realize is when we are, uh, we are professionals, I mean, we work with certain codes of ethics. And for example, as a researcher, when I want to do interviews, I have to apply for ethical clearance which can be a very painful process. You know, you need to submit an application. You need to explain why your, your project is significant, why it matters. Um, and those codes of ethics are not always communicated to people outside our profession. OK, so this can create this kind of you know, miscommunication, again, mistrust here. So I would say we have two problems here. We have the mistrust between stakeholders and the mistrust of technology. I mean, we talk a lot about mistrust of technology, you know, people not trusting AI. Uh, we had a question in the chat this morning about, you know, AI and AI bias. Uh, but we don't talk a lot about mistrust between stakeholders. And I think it's important that this, uh, this issue uh, is emerged, basically, that we talk about that. So, because that can, you know, compound the effect of the mistrust of technology. So this is an interview that we did with uh, Shah uh, Edgerton from the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Uh, we did this interview as part of the last project last year uh, in November. And this is uh, what the interview we said. Uh, what do you need to make a new AI system? You need algorithms, you need people, you need computer, you need data. And for this AI system to also be useful in the world, you need funding and you need product market fit, and you need to have sufficient levels of trust and performance. So again, you know, this issue of trusting the technology is very much something we talk about, but again, perhaps we don't talk a lot about the mistrust of stakeholders. So two different problems here. So the two questions I would like to to ask at this point is what are the potential applications of AI to make born digital archives more accessible and usable? And what are the obstacles to implementing them? 
So our central argument, and this is part by the way of uh, an article that I co-wrote with Aaron Rees, who is now at University of Leeds. Uh, uh, and this, in this article, which is open access, by the way, I can send you as a link if you're interested, uh, when we uh, argued that stakeholders share similar professional ethics. I mean, it's not so different uh, to work work in academia like myself and to work in the public sector like you know many of you uh, in this room or to work in the cultural heritage sector. We have similar professional ethics and sometimes again we don't talk about those similarities. So really surfa surfacing these similarities can lead to deeper collaboration between stakeholders. So I think it's important that we talk about our common points basically instead of perhaps um, thinking that other people are totally different uh, from us. So so trust and collaboration, this is absolutely central when we are talking about the archival circle. So what do I mean exactly by archival circle? Well, we start with the record creators, like for example, people in government who create records. Uh, then those records are moved to the uh, archival institutions, to archivists, and of course those records are then used by users, researchers and other people. So this is uh, really uh, what we can uh, imagine as a circle and again trust and collaboration should be central here and of course that is not always uh, the case. So section one is really about the mistrust of other stakeholders and of technology and let me uh, give you a few uh, examples here of the interviews that we did just to uh, so that you have a good sense of what we are talking about. OK, so let's start perhaps with this issue of a digital dark age. So this is what uh, James Baker, who is uh, an academic, he's a former uh, glam sector professional. He used to work at the British Library. And two years ago, when we were doing the pilot project, you know, that led to the last uh, project, when we interviewed James and he told us, I always feel very sorry for my archivist friends every time historians turn around and say, well, you must collect everything. And why aren't you trying? You know, you need all this stuff. And it's going to be a digital dark age. And they are like, it's not going to be a digital dark age. Uh, we always do selection. You know, it's just that selection issues are kind of way more complicated now in the age of the born digital, um, in the age of the born digital. So what, what he means really is that we have this pressure from researchers, from historians to keep everything because, you know, for a historian, for a literary scholar like myself, you know, the more sources that we have, the happier that we, uh, we are. But for an archivist, of course, it's not possible to keep everything. I mean, appraisal has always been at the core of the, uh, of the profession. So really, we have this mismatch here between the needs of the historians and the needs of uh, the archivists here. And what James is saying is that it, it's not going to be a digital dark age. That's a total miss. Perhaps we can have a conversation about this because I think that's a big question here. The scale of born digital archives, that's of course uh, a big problem that we have. Uh, two years ago, we interviewed Jason Barron, who's going to speak this afternoon actually. And he told us uh, the National Archives in the US today has 500 million emails from the Reagan administration to the Obama administration. The Trump emails haven't been counted yet or haven't been fully processed, but it has 500 million distinct emails and then more than a billion pages because those emails have attachments. So, of course, the scale is absolutely huge. So how can you deal with these kind of materials? How can you search these kind of materials? It's going to be, of course, extremely difficult, uh, which is why you know, AI can be a useful tool here, especially when keyword search doesn't work well. Okay, So that's an example of the scale of own digital collections, and I'm sure all of you have many examples of you know this mass of uh, documents that we all have in our uh, record systems. 
Trusting the user is a, a big thing as well. We interviewed uh, Adam Nix, who was one of the speakers at the previous last uh, workshop, as some of you might remember, and he told us, I would like to see more focus on sharing that duty of care between the archives and the users. I think users need to take a far more active and conscious role in maintaining the integrity of the archival discovery process. And I think that can be done by having well-developed and well-respected codes of conduct that the user very consciously agrees with beforehand. Which means that even if they see sensitive information, that sensitive information goes no further than that individual researcher. So again, it's come, it comes back to the issue of trust. Okay, It's important for archivists to trust the user as a researcher and how can you do that well you know perhaps if we had to sign a, a code of conduct saying that if we find sensitive information well we are not going to put that on twitter we are not going to put that online of course we are going to keep that you know for ourselves and perhaps you know after getting the, the correct permission you know uh, moving to a publication stage but only after you know checking that uh, we have the correct permissions so why is this issue of trust again is absolutely central here Providing access responsibly, that's another uh, big thing here. Uh, we interviewed John Sheridan, again, one of our uh, speakers this afternoon uh, from the National Archives, uh, and he told us, and I love this quote, archives are not WikiLeaks. We are not in the WikiLeaks business. It's not responsible to data subjects. It's not responsible to other people's intellectual property rights. It's not lawful. So uh, we then need to build the techniques to provide access responsibly. Okay, so access is absolutely central. But what John Charita is saying here is that uh, responsible access is, uh, is crucial. Okay, and I'm sure, you know, uh, the vast majority of researchers will agree with that. We don't want access to everything. We want access, you know, responsible access, basically. So section two is about collaborations and building trust. So we talked a lot about mistrust, about miscommunication. How can we move on? How can we build this kind of collaborations uh, and, and trust? And you remember Adam Nix gave us some clue already. Perhaps, you know, it's a question of signing a document saying that if we find sensitive information, we are not going to reveal everything. OK, so do we have any uh, more ideas here? Knowledge transfer, that's a, a big thing. John Sheridan is saying it. it's all about the knowledge transfer into our sector from outside. No one is building anything specifically for us. Okay, He's talking, of course, about the archival sector here. It's all about things that are being built in the world. And then someone's going, oh, I could apply this to archives. And I think all we can really do is equip ourselves with learning to understand what that kind of technology transfer process looks like and understand what the implications are. OK, no one is building anything specifically for us. I guess that's a, that's a, a, an important point here. And he adds that. So it's quite hard for us to know how to navigate uh, this world where while we have collections, we're effectively, certainly in terms of budgets and in terms of capacity, we are fleas around elephants and we are not on our own. These issues are persuasive. And again, I think it's about not just talking to each other, but talking to other people who share concerns. And that's going to be very important uh, too. OK, so this idea is actually to talk really to, to have this meaningful conversation between us stakeholders. Um, let's let's have a look at, you know, actual uh, experiences of, you know, bringing archivists and researchers together. This is from a glam sector professional that we interviewed uh, two years ago, and they say, we have had a few attempts at trying to run events for researchers to find out what they might be expecting or what they might want. And the majority of our existing core research audience is not yet working with born digital material. And again, I love this quote. Why? Because you know, I tend to assume that everyone is working with born digital archive. 
types. So that's definitely not the case. Again, it's like chicken and eggs. It's because many of those archives are not accessible, as that many researchers are not working with born digital archives. Um, if, of course, we had uh, easier access to email archives, for example, you know, it might be the case that more uh, academics would work on that. Because, yeah, somebody like me, I mean, I spend a lot of time trying and failing to get access. So I'm not surprised that so many people, you know, do not bother. Basically. Okay, so I think it's important to remember that, especially if you perhaps, you know, you work in the government sector, you don't have a lot of contacts with academics, you know, many academics are actually not working with born digital archives, but perhaps they would like to, you know, they would like to move on uh, to uh, to using those sources. And I think, of course, at some point we will have no choice, you know, if you're a historian and you work on the early uh, 21st century, well, you will need access to born digital archives. It's not a question of, you know, choice here. Uh, this is Andrew Wiley, uh, an archivist, again, that we interviewed in 2021, and he said, I thought the researchers would be much more confident, self-confident, but they all seem to doubt their essential skill sets as historians. So remember that those historians might not have any experience of working with born digital archives. Again, they hoped that they would be retired to, uh, before they had to do too much of this. Okay, and uh, Andrew was quite quite surprised by this, the fact that not many researchers are actually working with uh, with born digital archives. So again, it can be a bit frustrating to organize those, uh, those events, you know, with uh, with archivists, with academics, just because sometimes you know the concerns are not exactly exactly uh, the same. Yeah. So how can we facilitate access? So this is a government professional that we interviewed again in 2021. When you're talking about the public sector, the work we do is funded by public budgets or scrutinized by parliament and by journalists and by everyone else. Most of our work should be public by default. I think if more of our work uh, was public, I think more people would find it kind of boring. But also it wouldn't be in the case of data leaks, so full of secret truth of cabinet office emails released by aid. So again, perhaps something controversial here is that you know, most of our work, most of the work in government should be public by default. Uh, again, perhaps this is something that we can uh, discuss later on. So let me try to summarize what I've said here. I think the important point is that sometimes you know, people uh, fear betrayal, but there can be no betrayal without trust. And it is precisely this lack of trust in other stakeholders and in new technologies that was highlighted in our interviews. Okay, this is the common theme. This is something that we see over and over again. Lack of trust in other people and lack of trust in the technology. And of course, mistrust of technology makes it difficult to implement AI tools. So the concerns that our interviewees uh, pointed out, you know, in terms of accountability, in terms of control, in terms of bias, make it difficult to accelerate the development of AI applied to archives. So it's not so surprising that AI applied to archives is still at an experimental uh, stage. So what do we need? Well, we need more uh, cross-sector and cross-disciplinary dialogue uh, to, to really to sort of face this shared professional ethics between stakeholders. As I said at the beginning, it's not so different to work in academia and to work in the archive sector or to work in government. So if we had more conversation and we were really, uh, you know, trying to understand each other, you know, we might uh, move on and perhaps, you know, overcome this, uh, this mistrust and this mistrust. We also uh, research across disciplinary boundaries. That's really a must. Uh, I told you, you know, at first it was quite difficult to work with computer scientists for me. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, the more the more uh, of this work we do, as uh, better we get at it. And you know, it becomes easier to to share, you know, this common language, basically. And of course, I work in digital humanities. So by essence, it's an interdisciplinary field. Uh, so I think it has an important role to play in bridging the gap between record creators, archivists, researchers, and also users. So perhaps as digital humanists, we are well placed you know, to bridge this gap and to start this collaboration. 
So let me share this wonderful quote by Susan Collins, the Hunger Games are for there to be betrayal, there would have to have been trust first. And of course, there can be no betrayal without trust. So let me conclude this. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, everyone, do we have uh, questions from people in the room? I think we have approximately five minutes. Sir. Any questions at this point? And I'm going to open the uh, chat as well. Uh, I don't see the questions. So I'm going to yeah. stick my neck out slightly. Yeah. Um, you were talking about trust between stakeholders and, and mm -hmm. between sort of identified stakeholders. Of course, working in the public sector, one of our stakeholders is the public. Uh, and they get a lot of their information via various different media sources. Um, how do we get over the problem? Uh, somebody put it to me a while ago, you know, if you're a private sector and you make 50% of your decisions correctly, you'll make a profit. If you make 75% of your strategic decisions correctly, you'll make a big profit. If you're public sector and you make 95% of your strategic decisions correctly, public account committee will want to talk to you about the other 5% and the newspapers will put the other 5% in their front pages. How do we build trust between those of us that work in the public sector and the public? Mm. Yeah, I think it's it's difficult because um, I mean many professionals, including of course in academia, tend to be very risk adverse because there are some professional risks to making some decisions. Mm. And and I remember when I was working at the British Library, you know, several years ago, it was not possible to take photos of materials because of copyright reasons. And now you know it's it's possible just because you know they assume that you're not going to, be, uh, to put copyrighted materials online without permission. So I think they moved from a very uh, risk adverse position to something more pragmatic, basically. And I think, you know, um, things can change, obviously, you know, as bigger organizations, we tend, again, in academia, it's exactly the same, we tend to be very risk adverse. And, you know, sometimes we just need to be pragmatic, basically. But of course, you know, there is a, a legal uh, framework as well, which can be very restrictive. So there are so many issues, basically. So my answer is really there are no simple solutions, basically. <laughs> Any other questions? While we wait uh, that, uh, about the chat, I was, I was just curious, coming myself mm. from a background in the humanities, uh, what were the biggest challenges in assessing like uh, on, um, email archives uh, of writers? And uh, if you are aware of any difference in terms of uh, challenges that, for example, you faced when you were uh, trying to access the UMIQ and archive against uh, other kind of challenges in assessing uh, kind of non-online digital archives, you mean, you know, so yeah. Yes, yeah, so, so the email archive of Ian McEwan is an interesting example because I, I, I had to uh, uh, to good text us actually to, to consult the materials, so nothing was online. And the only reason they gave me access to the materials is that I knew the digital archivist at the time. I was organizing a workshop uh, as part of the British uh, Academy project. So I had some connections with them, and they, uh, they were very helpful. They brought a laptop in the reading room, you know, and I had access to a selection of emails. So it was not, uh, you know, the entire uh, inbox, it was just a selection of emails based on a list of keywords that I had sent them. Uh, the interesting thing is, so that was in uh, 2017, okay? And I went back to, uh, to ask in Texas, I think it was last summer, and I realized that actually the email archive is still close to researchers. So it's not, if you go to Austin today, you would not have easy access to, you know, to the emails of Ian McEwen. So, so access is not something which is, uh, which is easy for email archive. Same thing for the Susan Sontag archive, you know, at, the, at UCLA. Uh, I had access only to a very small selection of emails on emails that were very, very blunt in a way, you know, nothing about uh, very personal or anything. So I think, um, again, you know, I understand that archivists uh, do a selection of emails that's normal, that's part of their job, but sometimes there is a lot of uh, an attitude which is very risk adverse. 
So I think perhaps trusting that the user will not put everything online and will just you know, uh, be, uh, be professional, I think that's, uh, that's important as well. But I would say in the case of email archives, it can be a nightmare to get access to the archives, really. Not an easy process at all. <laughs> Um, There's someone in the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Do you want to read it? Yeah. Uh, David Adelson is asking you, let me just turn the camera on so people can actually see me. Uh, can you say a little more about what is happening in other jurisdictions in the field and what conversation with the information commissioner as a regulator? Yeah, I can't really comment on the um, information commissioner, but what I can comment on is the uh, different legislation, because I think that's not um, a coincidence that it's easier to get access to, uh, to form digital archives in the US okay, than in the UK. I mean, of course, the legal framework is totally different. Uh, um, so in the US, they tend to assume that if you find sensitive materials, you know, you're not going to, to share this without uh, permissions, which is why I had easier access to email archives in the US. You know, I gave you the example of Ian McEwen, Susan Sontag. Uh, in the UK, it's much more uh, complicated. So, of course, the legal framework has an impact on the kind of work that we can do um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and, and of course, continental Europe is still another, another story, of course. So, yeah, of course. We, we do need to be aware of this legal framework, absolutely. Uh, are there any more questions from the room or uh, anyone in the chat? I think, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, coming together from various disciplines and uh, talking with people that you might not necessarily have experience or even reason to talk with normally. Um, how have you found actually broaching to the same table and like, communicating with them, working with them? Have you? Uh, have you found like any potential solutions to not having common ground initially? Like difficulties of not knowing each other's disciplines or like the intricacies of what you do? Yes, that's a, a very good question. I mean, I remember when I started this kind of work, you know, with computer sciences, they were like, oh, literary scholar. I don't talk to literary scholars, you know, like, you know, they had absolutely no idea of the kind of, uh, the kind of work that we can do. And of course, vice versa, you know, we don't really engage with them on a regular basis. So I think um, just organizing these kind of events, you know, having coffees, having lunch together, that's really the starting point because we can, uh, you know, realize that we have some common concerns and many of you in this room uh, work in government you know you work with digital records and of course you need to think about the users because at some point those records are going to be transferred to the national archives to other archival repositories and are going to be used by users by researchers etc so i think just organizing this kind of events you know that can be a good starting point you know perhaps starting small and you know trying to be more ambitious later on Great, thank you. Well, that's a wonderful way to, uh, to conclude this session. 